if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels. You know, this passage suffers from familiarity. It's, it's heard so often at weddings that we could easily assume that chapter 13 is about two lovers. If you want something like that, then go to the steamy poetry of Song of Solomon, and that's where you'll find the biblical erotica. Now, I didn't choose to read this passage because it's Valentine's Day. Well, maybe I did a few weeks ago. But I actually think this is a text fitting as a response to this week's trial of the former president. It was a hard week. Like you, I watched again with horror the images of violent mobs incited by their commander, smashing doors and windows, crushing their law, crushing law enforcement between doors and beating them with pipes and flagpoles. We heard them chant death to the vice president, a gallows built and noose hung conveniently nearby. I felt something in my throat as horrified senators scurried through the labyrinth of hallways to avoid the mobs. And I cried while House members recounted grabbing gas masks and removing their congressional pins, listening as battering rams tried to break into the chamber. This week was traumatizing for them and for all of us, the whole country, all over again. Or, it was no big deal. I mean, it was boring enough to sit doodling with your feet up. Our are we really so divided that we can't even agree on this? Paul was so concerned about what he heard regarding the bitterly divided Corinthian church, he sat down to compose a letter to them, and perhaps we might consider his words about love. But we can't skip to the words of love in chapter 13 without first going through conflict in chapter 12. Paul received word about contention among the Corinthians, arguing about whose gifts were the greatest. He wrote to them and said, There are a variety of gifts that all come from the same Spirit. To one person is given wisdom, to another knowledge. To one is given faith, and to another healing, or prophecy, or discernment of spirits, or miracles, tongues, interpretations of tongues. There are, there are lots of gifts of the Spirit. But he kept repeating, not one of them is better than another because they all come from the same Spirit. The Spirit decides who gets what. So how could one be better? Stop arguing. Paul continued by describing or comparing the church to the body of Christ. That no part of the body is more important than another. He explained, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Furthermore, no part of the body is more honorable than another. In fact, Paul said, the less respectable members of the body should be treated with greater respect. And this wasn't just metaphor or rhetoric. The, the early church was radically egalitarian. Men and women shared leadership, often to the amazement of outsiders. In the church, people who were slaves and people who were free were to be equals. Jews and Gentiles worshipped together, although there were still questions they debated about such things as whether non-Jewish believers had to become Jewish first in order to be Christian. And that was also part of that conflict Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12 is one of the most important and consequential parts of the Bible, laying out in the midst of conflict a beautiful description of the Christian way. No part of the body is more important than another, as Paul said. Honor was to be given to the least. And of the many wonderful gifts of the Spirit, not one of them is better than another because the same Spirit gives them all. So we ended chapter 12 by saying, after all of that, but strive for the greater gifts. Now wait, I didn't think any gift was better than another, but some are greater? And still more curiously, these are not spirit-given? We have to strive for them? 
That's when he told a, a bitterly divided people that he would show them, quote, a still more excellent way and said, if I tongue, speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Those words have a context among a divided people. They aren't the flowery words of an imaginary world, but a real challenge to living, breathing people. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to even remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I gave away all my possessions, and if I hand my body over, so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul explained this is the still more excellent way. There's faith, and there's hope, and there's love, but the greatest of these is love, for which he calls us to strive. Love is patient. Or are we to strive for love that is patient? Love is kind. Or are we to strive for love that is kind? And perhaps it's both. That love is, and we must strive for love that is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Strive for love that does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. Strive for love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Strive for love that never ends. So on the one hand, all that striving sounds exhausting, not exactly a gift. On the other hand, I can do that. That's hopeful because we can strive for love when we're not feeling it. We can strive for love that never ends. Although I have to add in my experience and perhaps in yours as well, some love ends. Some love is asked to bear, put up with too many things, even becoming an excuse for abuse. And maybe that's one way we know this passage isn't first and foremost about two lovers or a marriage. But Neither do I think a community or country should simply put up with anything and everything. And I appreciate Paul's clarification that love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. <sighs> but then there's the Senate. We were not only traumatized by repeated images of Violent mobs, pictures of gallows and noose, haunted by chants and screams and battering rams. Worse, the means for even a modicum of justice was offered, but denied in monstrous and preposterous ways, to use the words of the indefensible. Truth was spoken, but to use the words of Paul, people rejoiced in wrongdoing. Can we be honest? Love? I don't love those people. I don't want to love those people. They have no interest in loving back. I'm, I'm tired of striving for love from, from hateful people. But of course, to be clear, there are still some good but misguided people in that mix. Now, not in the sense of some very fine Nazis, but people with whom we simply share a different worldview, some of whom are members of our families. <sighs> but it's the others that draw me ever dangerously closer to hate. That is, if we're willing to be honest. To which I hear Paul saying, keep striving for that more excellent way. Keep striving for love, and that will make a difference. I mean, Dr. King had a lot of personal experience with this, and he explained, hatred paralyzes life. Love releases it. Hatred 
confuses life, love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life. Love illuminates it. That's what love does. That's why I think 1 Corinthians 13 is just what we need today. Strive for love. Strive for love that is patient and kind and all the rest. Keep hoping for it, praying for it, for as long as necessary. Because love does not give up. And because God is love, our striving for love puts us into the presence of God. And with that, we can do anything. I know it was a hard week. But we can keep striving for love together.